Oligonucleotides. It's oligonucleotides. Yeah. Oligonucleotides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So could you explain that? Sorry, in a bit more detail, because. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so these are a completely new modality for drugging genes. So it's there are genes that you cannot drug with small molecules for various reasons. Um, you know, it's very difficult to get a small molecule that has a single activity for a start. Quite often you find that they do other stuff. Um, what this is doing is it's targeting a specific sequence within the genes. So we can target the on-off switch of the gene to turn it on or off. We can target bits of the gene that are to do with stability to either make, it, make that transcript more stable or less stable, depending on what we want. We can also directly influence the splicing patterns. So you know, if you've got a gene that makes two things and you want it to make this and not that, you can basically force the cells to make this and not that using an oligonucleotide because you can sit an oligo over the control regions that basically block the access to the splicing factors. So you can influence when and where a particular splice variant is made and how much. So, and, you're, and that's sequence based. So it's, it's basically, you've got, you've got your sequence and then the oligonucleotide is basically a bit of DNA or RNA that sticks to it. And, that can have several different outcomes depending on the nature of that oligonucleotide. So you can get oligonucleotides that, that bind and block. So they, they're, they're inert, they just sit there and they stop things binding. So you can mess with stability that way, you can mess with, um, you can mess with splicing that way. There are oligonucleotides that you can put in which will specifically cause the transcript to be degraded, called siRNAs they're called. There are also other classes of oligos which can cause things to be switched on. They're called SA RNAs. So there are whole, you can use them in different ways and different contexts, depending on what you want. Now, when you're looking at them from a drug development perspective, they're actually really quite attractive because you can, because you're very specifically pinpointing a sequence and a specific sequence in that gene, it's not going to hurt anywhere else. So when we're designing them, one of the things we do is we look is there any possibility that this can bind anywhere else? That's one of the very first sort of things we do when we're designing them. So they're designed to be specific to this 21 or 22 base pair sequence in your gene. So it's a pair of molecular tweezers. You can stick it in and it will affect there. Because of the precision of the, of, of the approach, you can use tiny doses. So, you know, when you're putting in a, a small molecule, you're dealing with bioavailability, you're dealing with metabolism, you're dealing with a whole bunch of different things that are going to impact on the final amount of your small molecule that's in the body. An oligonucleotide, you can get them down to nanomolar or even picomolar quantities to have a very, because it's so targeted, a very specific effect. Um, the other advantage of an oligo is that the, an oligonucleotide is an oligonucleotide is an oligonucleotide. It's just a chain of bases. So, and the behavior of those in cells is actually really quite well understood. So the specificity to your gene or your indication comes from the sequence. So, you know, if you make, if you make a new chemical, if you make an analog, a new chemical analog, and you, you've got to go, and every time you tweak that analog a little bit, You've got to go, it may have completely different physiological consequences on the cells, completely different distributions, completely different bioavailabilities. Whereas the oligos, that is all pretty standard and you can make tweaks. It's a little bit like with the RNA vaccines that you can tweak the sequence and it will, you know, it, it will change. You can change the target without changing the chemistry, if that makes sense. So they're actually quite attractive um, from a, a drug development perspective, they do have their challenges. So delivering them systemically has been and remains to be a challenge, but delivering them locally actually is remarkably um, easy, well, it's easy, but it's a lot easier. Um, there are now new chemical backbones, chemical, you know, the actual nucleosides themselves, there's different chemistries on those, um, which are more stable, not immunogenic. The, the original ones are quite immunogenic. These new ones are not. Um, and the stability means that they hang around in the cells. So you've got this kind of timed release effect, as I was saying. Um, you can also modify not just the bases, but how the bases are joined together on the backbones. So that there's a whole lot of emerging chemistries. You can then couple that with delivery. 
so you can put it in a lipid nanoparticle that you can target to a specific cell type with a you know you can effectively postcode them so there there it, it's a really up and coming area in drug development and eminently um suitable for what we want to do because we want to we want to get in there on a very precise molecular level and and be dealing with this splice site in this gene with one sequence so that's that's why we've gone down that route that was very interesting i mean we've been we've been using them experimentally in in the academic you know, on the academic side of things, and I remain both with a foot in both camps. Um, we've been using it for decades, well, not decades, but but maybe, maybe the last sort of 15 years or so, we've been using them routinely um, in, in culture. Um, it has been more difficult to use them in vivo until fairly recently because of the challenges with the chemistries and the delivery. But I think over the last, there are I think 14 or 15 now oligotherapies approved and in clinic and in use. And six or seven of those have been in the last year or so. So it's we're right at the dawning of a completely new era in, in medicine, I think, actually. So, you know, the power of RNA as a therapeutic. Um, I've, you know, I've been I've been enthusiastic about RNA for about 26 years now. But this last year, actually, the last two years with the with the pandemic and, and the success of, of the, you know, the RNA vaccines, we no one expected them to be that good. Um, and the fact that it's it's a framework that you can now tweak for variants and things like that. It's a really good time to be working with RNA. You, you looked at the reversal of senescence in, in vitro, right? Yes. Have, you, have you had any opportunity to look in vivo? Not yet. It's early, early days for us. Right. Um, I mean, I think that's coming. So, so this, this will probably be on the, the industry side because uh, as, as I said I've got two I wear my, my team laughing leads I have two hats um I've got my academic hat I'm interested in a lot of the nuts and bolts around the edges of it and the you know how we can how exactly how it's working and how we can attenuate it and on the other side as 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 as, as I said we're we're developing this you know towards eventually new new sets of therapeutics um so yeah it's um it's an interesting time to be to be doing it 